This is Friday, December 28th, 2018. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Raphael de Grudela. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? May 15, 1935. And where were you born? In Cambridge. And where do you live now? In Natick. And your marital status? It's married. And do you have children? Three daughters mm -hmm. and who are grown up now. Okay. <laughs> Any grandchildren? Uh, one, two, let's see, <laughs> my grandchildren, <laughs> two. Two. All right. And tell us a bit about growing up in Cambridge. Um, it was, uh, we didn't live in Cambridge too long. Uh, mm -hmm. We moved from Cambridge to Somerville. Uh -huh. And so we were right close to the Somerville line and then my father uh, found a place that we rented as an apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long did I live in, in Somerville? Or probably through high school, Okay. 1953. I graduated from Somerville High School. And what did your father do for a living? Well, my father was originally a musician, professional musician, and then he started, when the war was on or whatever, he started working in the clothing industry. Um, Trimont Clothing was a big uh, mm -hmm. manufacturer in Boston at the time, and he became a foreman, if that means anything. But, yeah. uh, uh, and then uh, we were living in Somerville on Broadway, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Somerville, but the, mm -hmm. it's right at the bottom of the hill, goes up mm -hmm. into, uh, you know, the, uh, I don't know what they call that area now, but uh, mm -hmm. that's where. <clears throat> I always feel a little concerned about it because I remember the, there were so many gangs at the time, and, um, you know, going through what the, the Bulger thing and all like that. I wasn't part of any gang, but mm -hmm. uh, that was a time in Somerville when, uh, they had moved into a certain area up in the hill and uh, was controlling a whole lot of uh, <laughs> clandestine or noxious kinds of uh, professional. Okay. <clears throat> so you uh, went to schools in Somerville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somerville High School, graduated from Somerville High School, then uh, went into the Army okay. as a musician, which meant I had to take a, an audition for the Army band at Fort Devens, which was one of the oldest bands in the service. Um, and I passed it as a clarinetist mm -hmm. and became a, a solo clarinetist with the 18th Army Band, which was one of the oldest ones, mm -hmm. as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. in, uh, Before in we get any further into that, let's reel it back a little bit to okay. more uh, of your childhood. Do you remember uh, when in 1941 when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Yes, I do. Okay, yeah. and what was happening? Well, everybody was concerned. There was, you know, what we were involved in ensuing war, you know, mm -hmm. with the, and uh, it, was, it was, wasn't a bad time for the family because the Trimont Clothing Company at the time was making uniforms for the soldiers. So my father, who became a foreman in, in that, uh, the business there, and. Uh, which was good because uh, that's how we made a living out of his <laughs> salary. And my brother and I, uh, you know, was, were in the Somerville High School. And my father was very strong. He was a cellist uh, when he came over from Italy, but he was strong in uh, making sure that his two sons studied music, which was fine with us because we, and so I was clarinet and saxophone player. Uh, and my brother, similar, we were mm -hmm. both with reed instruments. Um, my father was helpful. He always wanted us to play. So my brother played a saxophone, I played clarinet, and we got into local bands at the time. Uh, so it was kind of fun. And did you play classical or jazz or Both. any? <laughs> okay. At that time, <clears throat> um, everything was taught classically, you know, which was good because it was a good foundation. To, you know, whether we became musicians or not, we both went to college uh, not being musicians, <laughs> but. Um, the good part of that was when it came to the point where I had this, I wanted to do service, you know. Um, there was an 18th Army band at Fort Devens, which was one of the oldest bands uh, mm -hmm. in, in the service. 
Do you need more, or is that a thing? Well, we can, um, I just wanted to get a little more about the, you the growing times. up during the war years. Do you right. remember mm -hmm. things like rationing? And yeah, you know. that, right, that was a concern. My father, uh, you know, had to work as a, mm -hmm. a laborer. Uh, he, you know, became a foreman, which was good, because then it allowed us a little more freedom with, mm -hmm. if we needed clothes or, you know, et cetera. Um, so it was it was a hard time because my mother even took on my mother was also a a, cuss, a dressmaker mm -hmm. and had her clients out of the house. I mean we all you know we all we were lived lived on Broadway going up the, mm -hmm. uh, the hill, and uh, she always had customers coming in, and the place that we lived in was a, a, a nice home on Broadway owned by uh, Dr. Jones. And my mother sort of took care of his mm -hmm. office, and, and he didn't charge us any rent, mm -hmm. so which was kind of nice. So, but growing up in Somerville wasn't easy as a as a young person, my own age, mm -hmm. 15, 14, 13, whatever it was, right. because there was a lot of things going on. The Winter Hill Gang was right up the street, right. and you had to cross your T's, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, uh, they'd kill you. <laughs> it was a sin. <laughs> As easy as that, it was. It was. It wasn't a rough neighborhood because we were living in a house that was owned by a doctor, medical doctor, and my mother acted as the his secretary, basically. And um, but it was a time where uh, the Winter Hill Gang was, a, you know, a fifteen walk, a fifteen minute walk up the street, of which I didn't interact with, but I knew who they were, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and if you didn't join a gang at that time, you could, your life could be in danger. So you had to make sure that you knew how to make friends, but stay away from the areas or, you know, where they would want to indoctrinate you, so to speak. Okay. Which they tried to do to my brother, um, which I had to call my father. Uh, they got him and put some wood and was lighting a fire uh, as he was tied in the back of what the theater was at that time. So I ran home and got my father, and he came down and shooed them away, you know, reluctantly, but uh, um, saved my brother from probably getting burned badly, you know, to what extent after. But mm -hmm. when my father came down, they sort of took off, uh, there were about three or four of them. So it was kind of a rough neighborhood, but we didn't live on the top of the hill, so we weren't part of the Winter Hill mm -hmm. Gang, which was very popular mm -hmm. among uh, young men in middle-aged men that were part of that. Now, did you play music while you were at Somerville High School? I did. I was in the uh, band and the orchestra. I was an assistant solo clarinetist in the orchestra. So uh, my father was very strong on raising us as good musicians, uh, knowing how to read music, playing instruments. I played saxophone, tennis saxophone, and clarinet. Mm -hmm. So with tennis saxophone, I could get into the groups that were around mm -hmm. playing. Um, and as clarinet, I became assistant solo clarinetist with the uh, school orchestra, mm -hmm. which, was a, which was good training. So now let's get you graduated, and mm -hmm. you're 18, so were you drafted into the Army, or did you choose to? I would have been drafted, so I joined. You joined. The 18th, huh? And they had, uh, at Fort Devens, one of the oldest bands mm -hmm. in the Army, so uh, I auditioned for it and passed it. Uh, as an assistant solo clarinetist. Mm -hmm. Again, my father's input to right. make sure we had some skills in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Now, was this, bef uh, did you do basic as well, or was uh, this? No, I did basic okay. after I was uh, enlisted into the right. uh, Army. I took an audition for the 18th Army Band, and that's how mm -hmm. I served three years in the service, and that's how I got my college education paid free, because my parents weren't so wealthy that they mm -hmm. could send me to college. So. And where did you do your basic? Basic training, Fort Evans. At, so that and was pretty close. It was close. So um, it worked out, worked out well. Both my brother and I were, um, he was all three years older, so he was in the band. And when I went up for audition, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then he was leaving and I was coming <laughs> in. So they had a transition of the the Grootler boys. <laughs> okay, so now you're in the Army, in the Army band. And um, so you say, what if, we did most of the, I remember getting up at 4 o'clock, 4.30 every morning to play. You know, it was part of the tradition of, with the 18th Army band. 
and, uh, and that was a good experience. My brother was uh, in the band first, and then as he left, I came and played mm -hmm. and became solo clarinetist for the 18th Army mm -hmm. Band, which, as I mentioned, was one of the oldest in the right. Army at mm -hmm. the time. And where did you perform? Uh, we performed for a lot of different uh, dignitaries that came through Fort Devens, which was one of the early uh, you know, uh, areas of, of music for anybody enlisting. Okay, the band in Somerville performed for any Veterans Day marches or things like that. Uh, it was mostly you know, a showcase for the, uh, one of the oldest mm -hmm. army bases in the United States. Right. You mentioned dignitaries. Uh, any stand out in your mind? Uh, we had, uh, who was it? It was uh, from the New York area. Mm -hmm. We had a person that came down occasionally to give lessons to the people. Fortunately, I was, and my brother, we were both, uh, it was an orchestra that we were in. And um, we got a good uh, basis in classical music at the time that we played in jazz groups mm -hmm. <laughs> on our own. So, yeah. you know, because you had to keep up with what was going on with the people your own age, so. Mm -hmm. And did you perform outside New England? Um, yes, we did. We performed in New York City um, and, uh, and all around uh, Massachusetts. You know, whenever there was a function, like the parades we have then, you know, we were one of the first bands uh, because we were one of the oldest bands. In right. The, in the and how big was the band? I'd say about maybe 55, 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had brass sections, woodwind sections, mm -hmm. et cetera. We had some singers as well, you know. Yeah. And we marched, used to march, uh, you know, on, on the holidays, you know, the, the, you know, with the different bands. There was like there was one in Cambridge, there was another one in Charleston and all like that. So mm -hmm. there was a, a critique of, you know, service bands. Okay. And before the interview, you had actually sent me this photo of you in uniform. Right. If you want to no. hold that okay. up for a that, moment. That, uh, right. Hold it up. <laughs> and tell us a little more about when that photo was taken. Okay. <clears throat> and while I was in the 18th Army Band at Fort Devens, I saw there was an audition for the 1st Army Band in, in Washington. And so uh, I had to attend the music conservatory in Washington for both Army and Navy musicians. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for an audition, and I passed it um, because we had good training. And uh, so what happened when people were being shipped out, um, they needed an assistant solo clarinetist in New York City. Uh, or, and they also had a con, uh, conservatory in Washington. Uh, so I took the audition for the conservatory in Washington, D.C., and I passed it as a system solo clarinetist and saxophonist because I was playing tennis sax since they were brother sisters kind of things with two in reed <laughs> instruments. So, um, but they had these fancy uniforms. Mm. So whenever we went out to play for some function of the, you know, mm -hmm. They had a lot of functions for senior, you know, soldiers, and it, and, and we were the band, and uh, and they had a conservatory there that I auditioned for the conservatory. I think mm -hmm. I mentioned yes. that. Mm -hmm. So I spent uh, two years in Washington at the conservatory. Um, I was in the orchestral orchestra, and I also mm -hmm. was in the jazz band. So uh, I had both feet in different styles uh -huh. of music. Back, thank you. And that was in when we were in the army part of the mm -hmm. band because we always had nice uniforms. Now, while you were performing first with the 18th and then with the first army band, did you have any other duties? That's it. It was all performing. It was mm -hmm. always, you know, when St. Patrick's Day prayed, we were in there uh -huh. as one of the first bands coming down the street. But when I was, came back from there, in the years I spent at Fort Devens, then. I was getting close to the, you know, there was, um, there were two options. I could go down to New York City and play in the first Omni band in New York City, or I could go to Korea. <laughs> so obviously, and I only say that because when I was in the conservatory down in Washington and I, they got orders, I got orders to go, you know, to combat. And I said, but I have a letter from the CEO of the band 
that I'm supposed to go back to the 18th Army Band up in Fort Devens. And they said, well, you know, they're disbanding that. It was, even though it was the oldest band in the Army at the time, they were saying they're going to disband that group. And I said, well, you know, as this letter that the colonel of the in Fort Devens gave me, it said, I would be sent back to the 18th Army Band at Fort Devens. Everybody else was sent to Korea and places like that. So, um, and at the time, they did have bands in the war zone. However, uh, and you can put two and two together, if you have an enemy and you're playing a musical concert for your members, uh, they had time to zero in on the bandsmen to blow up. So it became very fluid because every time they had a band, you know, many of the musicians were killed because they, the, um, you know. So that was kind of a, a tricky kind of thing. But with my letter from the uh, assistant general or what they would call mm -hmm. it, at the time, they had to send me back to the 18th Army Band. They couldn't send me to Korea at the time. And you probably, thank God you had oh, that letter. <laughs> thank God I did that letter because there weren't many people at the time. Mm -hmm. But there weren't many people because people were studying music to be professionals, you know, as my father, you know, wanted us to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just was a, a lucky thing that I had this letter because they were going to send me to Korea at the time. And so I went to the colonel in charge of the uh, music academy down in New York City. And he said, uh, you're not going to Korea. You're lucky. Mm -hmm. And because you have this letter, I have to, this is a command that I have to obey. I didn't say anything. I just right. kept my mouth shut. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say, no, send me to the combat area because mm -hmm. I want the experience. So I went back to the 18th Army Band at Fort Devens. Mm -hmm. And being up there a, a year or two, because we did all the marches and things like that, uh, there was an opportunity to go to the, music, con the Naval School of Music in Washington, D.C. So I took an audition. I made an appointment to go down and take an audition. And I passed it. Uh, and they needed an, a, a solo clarinetist. So, I mean, everything happens, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a crazy way. You know, the war is going on. And yet, you know, because I had skills as a musician, and they always had musicians because eventually I'll mention to you I got sent up to the first army band in New York City which mm -hmm. was a premiere we played for all of the officers that were being retired or you know etc so uh, and they sent me to, you know I got into the conservative the naval school mm -hmm. music in Washington so uh, you know you say how does life work out you know for you and you never know you know but mm -hmm. there was that colonel who was in charge at Fort Devens who I had the letter and I made sure I kept it you know, and showed it to him. He just said, no, you're going down to, you know, uh, you're going back to the, the band at Fort Devens. But then I saw the, on the bulletin board there, an audition for the first army band in Washington, D.C. So I made an appointment to mm -hmm. go down, passed it, and they sent me to school, a conservatory, basically, a music. Mm -hmm. the, how things happen are, are weird, you know, you know. And of course, I was overjoyed. I mean, it wasn't that I didn't want to serve, but the point is that I had skills and it was following in my footsteps to be mm -hmm. a professional musician. Raphael, do you have any recollections about li Army life with the band? Are there, are there any particular people you remember? You mean after I got out of the conservatory in Washington, D.C.? Well, uh, 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 just during those three years you were in the Army. Okay, when I was sent up to the First Army Band, uh, which wasn't, the 18th was in Devon, so yeah, First Army course. Band, it was an elite group, okay? Mm -hmm. We played for any of the retiring generals or right. colonels, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, and so, and I also learned how to play jazz. Uh, it was unusual because I was a small guy and I played baritone saxophone <laughs> and, uh, at, in the Army Band mm -hmm. <laughs> down in Washington. So going through the concert, the Naval School of Music, as an army musician, uh, I took an audition and they entered me into the conservatory, basically, what it was. Um, I became a very high-skilled professional musician. Uh, in fact, a buddy of mine who was, we were, you know, assistants to each other, there was an opening in the army band in New York City, which was a premier band. We played for all the dignitaries and all. And he said, Raphael, take this, you know, they need uh, reed players. And that's when I went. And that 
leaving Fort Devens and leaving Massachusetts and went up to Washington, D.C. And, uh, and I, that band that I was in Washington, D.C. was, you know, or the conservatory that I came out of, with, which had the orchestra, um, they also had a good jazz program. And so uh, they needed a baritone saxophone in, in the band. Give me a small guy with this big baritone saxophone. And uh, so I played in the, in the dance band, and, the, and so whenever the, the, at the, you know, the areas they needed musicians, you know, I'd go with a quartet uh, playing tenor sax, so I just moved down from baritone to tenor sax, and stayed there for a while, and then was sent to the first army band in New York City, which was a very exclusive, only, it only played for dignitaries, dignitaries right. mm -hmm. and so forth, so, and I stayed up there two and a half, three years, and then I got discharged, you know. Okay. And uh, at that time, you know, they paid for your college education, which my parents didn't have the money to send me to college. Mm -hmm. And I took an audition to go to Boston University, and I passed it. Um, and so I spent four years at Boston University doing uh, undergraduate work. And what was your major at BU? Music, uh, Music. yeah. They had an orchestra, but they had musicians teaching the, you know, the particular sax section, trumpet section, you know, brass section. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, I stayed in music because that was, to me, the, that I could continue my development and skills and also uh, prevented me from going to Korea. And so being in the first army band in New York City was, was a, an honor yes. because I could take auditions for orchestras, et cetera. Um, and, uh, or I could, you know, go to college, you know. After they sent me, uh, I got discharged, mm -hmm. and um, I had four years of college, uh, so I went to Boston University and got my degree in philosophy. Uh, it's kind of crazy at the time getting a degree in mm -hmm. philosophy, but I, I, and I was always writing at the time, writing poetry and keeping it, you know, journals and things like that. So um, that sort of started me on my professional life as a musician, um, played in dance bands at the time. Um, and uh, we played throughout the New England area as a, as a tennis saxophone player, mm -hmm. because I went from baritone, and they always used to make fun of me down in Washington, musicians from all, all over the East Coast that had auditioned as I had done and they said, you know, Raphael, you, you know, there's this pint-sized kid, you know, the, playing a big tenor saxophone, you know. And actually, they had me play baritone sax because I could also read in different clefs, uh, which most musicians that went into the service, they had the B flat, you know, and I could read in the E flat clef and all. So, I had that opportunity that I could switch off, carry a big baritone sax, and play in jazz bands and tenor sax, et cetera. So. It was all music after that, you know, uh, because then I applied to Boston University. And, I, and I, all the time when I was in New York City with the First Army Band, I was taking courses at Hunter College. And so I had something like, I think, I'm taking guesses at this, nine credits toward college that I got from, you know, just studying in New York City. And uh, so I went to Boston University. I got in, uh, and that was another, Another good experience because they had fine musicians. We all were from some service, Navy, Marines, or Army. <laughs> so we were all, uh, in a sense, professional musicians that, you know, that we now knew how to play jazz, knew how to play classical music, knew how to mm -hmm. jam, you know, be in court. I remember when I was uh, down in, uh, I forget the name of the group, but I was down in Philadelphia after I got sent up there. And, um, you know, they, <coughs> playing baritone sax at times, and they loved jazz, they loved jet baritone sax, you know. Of course, I had to learn how to breathe differently <laughs> because there's this big thing and I'm a little guy. Um, but it was good, good training, and um, we played for all the officers that were retiring or just getting, so I had an indoctrination that way, mm -hmm. too. Um, so then I went back to Boston mm -hmm. here and applied to Boston University yeah. and got accepted. So Raphael, for the record, you were discharged in 1956. Right. And what was your rank when you... I was a corporal. You were a corporal. Yeah. And did you receive any medals or commendations? Uh, they, I think I have a couple at home. 
-hmm. that just discharging and things like that, or being part of a elite band that went around and okay. played. Because mm -hmm. whenever an officer retired, you know, the band was there to right. play. And so, uh, and I graduated from the uh, Naval School of Music mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. So those things were all positive in my, when I had, uh, put in my application for Boston University College of Liberal Arts, and that helped out, you know, mm -hmm. as well as going to Hunter College in New York City when I was stationed well, down there. So all of those things played into, you know, me becoming a professional mm -hmm. musician. And did you join any service organizations? Uh, like? Elks or the American Legion or VFW? Uh, oh, not the VFW. VFW so, yeah, uh, was that. definitely part of, oh, okay. of me because uh, of my discharge, honorable mm -hmm. discharge. So when I finally got it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so your music, the, you just mentioned uh, your writing career. Right, okay. I've always kept uh, notebooks uh, writing and I always like to read poetry. So um, as I was in the service, especially the last couple of years, uh, I was reading, doing a lot of poetry. I'd go to poetry readings in Washington, D.C. I met some fine poets at the time down there. I went to Hunter College for mm -hmm. uh, six months or three months, I forget the, mm -hmm. it was, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so, you know, that was, uh, went to BU and I majored what? in uh, liberal arts and got my degree mm -hmm. and then. At the time, uh, what kind of poetry were you exploring? Well, I started out with classical poetry at the time, but then I got into jazz. I was doing some jazz poetry as well, which was very unique at the time because nobody was doing jazz poetry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anybody, if you're in it, they'll hire you immediately in a quartet or something. And I. Uh, I remember auditioning from a, couple, a trio once in a quartet, you know, and I could have gone that route, but then I decided, why don't I stay at Boston University and, and finish and get my degree from Boston University, mm -hmm. which I did. Uh, and, and I gigged, as we called it, in different places, um, mostly as a jazz musician at the time, you know, because uh, classical music, uh, even though I went to the Naval School of Music, which was considered a conservatory, it wasn't sophisticated like New England Conservatory. So I had to make a decision there saying, well, do I stay and try to become a jazz musician? You know, which my father said, you'll starve to death if you become a jazz musician. Uh, so I majored in liberal arts mm -hmm. with a concentration in philosophy. Okay. And, uh, and I continued writing poetry mm -hmm. all through this kind of thing, keeping notebooks. Uh, going to poetry readings. Um, most of my friends that weren't in music were poets uh, in Cambridge and bought mm -hmm. in uh, Somerville. Uh, and so I, I met a lot of fine people as, who were writers and I got inspired to do mm -hmm. writing. And what led you to haiku? Well, okay, that's another good question. Uh, I started out uh, just writing, you know, maybe sonnets and things like that. And I, I got a little bored with that longer technique. I said, you know, it takes almost two or three stanzas to get your point across. So, and then I was playing, I was gigging when I was a tennis sax player, whenever they had evening and they wanted a jazz band, you know, and stayed there for four years getting my degree. And then uh, I was, uh, I saw an opening for uh, an English teacher at a high school in Boston. And so I told them about my background and everything else so that I became, uh, you know, a teacher. And I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed working with junior high school kids at the time. That's the way we called them. And uh, so, and I kept playing jazz with, quite, you know, groups around Boston and things and all. But when, after I got my degree from Boston University, um, I played with the idea of going for my master's because my marks were good. Um, but I, don't know, I, I didn't feel like I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps because even though he was getting a good pension, you know, and my mother uh, could, you know, pro help us and, you know, uh, I, didn't, I didn't see music as a career. Um, I saw maybe jazz musician as a career, but I didn't see serious music because when I was in the band in New York City, uh, there were a lot of fine musicians. In fact, one of them, I, I was assistant solo clarinetist, 
the solo clarinets got into um, the New York City um, um, opera, I think he was got into. And he said, Raphael, why don't you come up and take an audition? Because he said, you know, you, you're a fine clarinet player and, and they're looking for reeds, you know. And, and I said, I don't know if I want to stay in music. I said, my father stayed in music for so many years and it was always a tough grind. I mean, he did become a foreman at the Trimon Clothing Company in Roxbury. Uh, so we weren't, mm -hmm. you know, but my mother, we'd always have to take extra work so we could make a little more money. I started teaching in the Boston Public Schools. Uh, they had some openings and uh, I applied for one as a, mm -hmm. as a liberal arts. I got my okay. degree in uh, Bachelor of Arts. And uh, I started teaching down in the north end of Boston because I needed an Italian teacher who was retiring and I was fluent in Italian. So I auditioned for that and I passed it and they, I became a teacher and stayed as a teacher for 43 years before. So you got most of it right there. Okay. I mean, uh, so when did you start writing for hai no, haiku in particular? Yeah, I think it was when I was uh, playing in the Fort Devens band, you know, mm -hmm. that I had, it was like a, we'd have to play Reveille at 11 o'clock, I mean, not 11, but 6 o'clock in the morning or some ridiculous <laughs> morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I started, I met somebody who was a writer uh, and we sort of had little groups together just reading to each other. So, mm -hmm. and I liked that. I liked mm -hmm. that I could be creative in a different way from playing music. And uh, so I, st I started writing and I met a lot of poets at the time. Um, and uh, went to Boston University, got my bachelor's, uh, Bachelor of Arts degree. Mm -hmm. And then I had more left on my GI Bill. So I decided to go to take, find out if I could go for graduate school at Northeastern. And I got in, I, you know, I went to Teachers College for a while. I was teaching and going to Teachers College in Boston. And um, from there, I just, you know, decided, mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to make music a career. Okay, right. My father had a hard time of it. And Best. I didn't particularly mm -hmm. want to follow that. So back to the poetry, how many books of poetry have you published? Or, or have you had published? This one here? Yeah. And then I became, I was an officer in the, I'm not an officer, but a poet in the Haiku Society of America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got a lot of good vibes. People said, you know, you're writing different. I used to write some jazz poetry and all like that. Nobody was writing jazz poetry at the time. Mm -hmm. So they said, you know, come down. You know, we're having open, they had open readings. You know, you could go any place like Somerville, mm -hmm. Medford, Boston, you know, reading poetry. And um, I did. I went mm -hmm. to different places while I was at Boston University, you know. Saturday mornings, I would go and read someplace, you know. Uh, and I think I remember even in the first orchestra at Boston University, I took an audition and it ended up as a solo clarinet, first clarinetist. So I, I saw what my father had gone through in music and it was a tough life, you know. And then I saw that when he became a foreman at the Trimon Clothing mm -hmm. Company, I saw he had, you know, administrative kind of skills and I said, well, you know, Dad, I don't know if I want to stay in music. And he said, don't. He said, go for something that's a little more substantial. He said, I, because he played in a dance band. Um, and at that time, they had a fancy, uh, not the dance band part, but they had quartets or quintets coming up. So he, this is going, I'm going backwards now. He joined one of these mus musical groups, a sextet. And he was playing in all these jazz clubs and, you know, throughout the United States, they traveled in a car. In fact, they have a picture of my father with the musicians all in a car, a nice car. I mean, they were all making money so they could put money into me. And they'd be, would, he'd go to New York City and he knew all, he'd go to Chicago. He knew all the names of all of the music spots in, in the northern part of the United <laughs> States, I mean, without going to Canada. And so, um, yeah, it happened like that, but I decided I didn't want to make a career. My right. father had a hard time and I didn't want to pursue it that way. So, so I stayed in teaching um, and then I saw the opportunity. They had a position in bilingual education in the Boston Public Schools. It was new. And I said, well, I've got the administrative background now. You know, uh, you know, should I do something with this? 
Uh, so, you know, I saw that music, my father worked very hard to become a professional musician. Um, they needed an, an administrator, and I used to write proposals for Washington, bringing money into the Boston public school system. So then they said, well, this, you know, obviously he's got some talent because he's brought in, you know, 20,000 or 30,000 this way and that, you know, so. Uh, so I became a teacher, and then I became a director uh, in education uh, of programs in, uh, what was the first thing I was, and we used to meet with new teachers and give workshops and things like that. And I felt that was fun. I enjoyed working with people and doing that. Um, now it's getting a little hazy because I stayed that way teaching. And then there was a position opening up as an administrator. And I applied for it. And I got it. Um, and so I started becoming an assistant to a, a director of uh, a program. Uh, and I stayed that way uh, teaching. Okay. Would you care to read a couple of selections? Okay. You want my poetry, right? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now you'll see the, the different stages of how my mental. I just opened this up to read okay. everything, mm -hmm. okay? It says Winter evening, thinking of nothingness, the depth of darkness. Winter evening, thinking of nothingness, the depth of darkness. A dried lemon falls from the tree. The day lengthens. A dried lemon falls from the tree. The day lengthens. Most of these are haiku. Mm -hmm. And I, when I started going into teaching and then got into administration, um, I saw that there were things about teaching I liked, but I didn't know I didn't want to teach English, you know, because they always had many English teachers. That wasn't easy. So I got into working with bilingual education. I wrote a proposal down to Washington. It was funded. So, you know, the Boston Public okay. Schools, we could hire more teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So that was kind of the, the way my life was being directed toward education. Um, I was good with people, I could understand people, we, I could, you know. So when they created, and I was part of that, the Office of Bilingual Education in the Boston Public Schools, um, I, I auditioned for one of the positions as, as a trainer, um, <clears throat> going into schools and working with English as a second language, because we had a lot of Spanish kids, Italian kids, and various Portuguese kids, um, and so, I, I pursued in that area, you know, let me, I really like teaching, I really like working with uh, students and all. So I stayed at Northeastern University and got my master's degree in, uh, in education. I'd, so I never really saw combat. Mm -hmm. uh, in basic training, they were going to send us to Korea because I was in that ilk age. And uh, I was frightened a little bit because, you know, you knew how many soldiers were being killed and it always, you know, the joke with, you know, the band would play, you know, for the mm -hmm. servicemen, you know, after the training went on, and that gave the time for the enemy to zero in on just where you are. Mm -hmm. And bandsmen were getting killed. And, uh, you okay. know, I, I... Just want to ask you one more question before we wrap up this interview, if Raphael. If you want me to read more, I'll read more. Okay. <laughs> um, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Very important. Okay. Very important, because... I felt that the United States, we always had to play the, an important part in making things happen. You know, one of the experiences, which was really frightening when I was in basic training, we were learning how to throw grenades and, uh, at night as well as during the day. And um, I remember the, the lieutenant that was teaching us brought us to he says, I want you people to learn a lesson. There were about a group of about 12 of us, you know, um, moving up the, to be coordinators or, you know, moving up into, uh, yeah, into not working on the line, you know, but moving up. But I do remember the night that we had a crawl in our stomachs as machine gun bullets were being fired over our head as a training mm -hmm. not to stand up, you know, because if you stand up, you were dead. 
And of course, I saw a kid maybe 20 feet from me get shot because he stood up. And you know, they, they warned us, don't stand up because the bullets are going to be flying over your head. As you know, soon as you stand up, you're dead. You know? And I was frightened a little bit. You know, I said, I've got a, you know, I'm going to get an honorable discharge you know, and uh, uh, go into education. Mm. You know? So would you like to read a couple yeah, more sure. passages? Yeah, I, did, I didn't read that much today. Okay. This was to a, a poet whom I knew, uh, Elizabeth Searle Lamb. Snow sparkles in the arroyo, afternoon of a fawn. Snow sparkles in the arroyo, afternoon of a fawn. In the shadows among fallen leaves, Jack in the pulpit. In the shadows among fallen leaves, Jack in the pulpit. Turning leaves of mind, new stars among the old. Turning leaves of mind, new stars among the old. This, now I'm, I'm going to shift here a little bit okay. because uh, I met a lot of uh, different poets from different countries and I met a lot of Japanese poets who were coming in and around and I got invited to Japan um, to do some workshops and things like that. And that's when I started, you know, different, going into a different culture. You know, after I graduated from Northeastern mm -hmm. and got my master's degree, right. mm -hmm. I saw the opportunity to do some traveling before I could take a, a permanent teaching job, which I did eventually. Anyway. Eventually, yes. And um, when I was in Japan um, with silk kimono and white zori, she steps through rain. I follow her lead through puddles. With silk kimono and a white zori, that was the, mm -hmm. what they would wear. She steps through rain. I follow her lead through puddles. On the hillside, the monks have planted mountain cherry trees. How beautiful the springtime blossoms. On the hillside, the monks have planted mountain cherry trees. How beautiful the springtime blossoms. I ask her to untie her sash and then watch her redo it with care around her waist. When I was in Japan, because I was invited to Japan, yes. mm -hmm. I mean, all of these things are crazy when you think about them. You know, why would I get invited to Japan? But <clears throat> a friend of mine was Japanese, and he said, Rafael, you want to come? I'll book some readings for you in you know, Japan, Tokyo, et cetera, et cetera. I said, jumped at the channel. You know, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids and all like that. I said, yeah. So I was invited to Japan. <laughs> and when was this? <sighs> Let's see what you meant. When was I invited to Japan? So it's got to be right after I graduated from Northeastern University, maybe mm -hmm. two years after I did my graduate work. So that uh, would be like late 50s, early 60s? Yeah, about that time. So you were in and Japan when they were still kind of rebuilding after the war. Right, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. But the Japanese people were beautiful people. I mean, everything was in English, Japanese and English, you know. So, and I, and met a lot of good Japanese poets, you know, the, because I, the Japanese language is very musical, and I enjoyed listening to Japanese, and they enjoyed listening to my English, you know, <laughs> so we had a mutual, uh, you mm -hmm. know, appreciation society type of thing, so, mm -hmm. and I, a friend of mine was Japanese, uh, who had come here to teach and things like that, so it's strange how life takes, it, <laughs> takes a indeed. shape, you know. I mean, if I had to say this was going to be the way my life was going, mm -hmm. I, I would have never guessed that I would go to a con naval music school, a conservatory, basically, that I would go down to Hunter College, you know, and play in the mommy band down there for a year or two, that I'd come back to Fort Devens where I started, you know, at the 18th Army Band. So every time I saw an opportunity to do something where I had the skills and could do it, I did it. So Rafa, anything else before we wrap things up? Well, ask me some questions about what things that I may not have touched on, and I'll mention that if I really <laughs> had any experience with it. In administration mm -hmm. was a lot of fun because I had skills as an administrator. Right. I could get along with people. Um, I 
would support people who were trying to learn different things. When I, and I learned some of this in, in Japan when I, when I was there for a month, um, knowing how to deal with people that I didn't understand their language, but I understood their you know, physical movement kind of thing. So, uh, and I liked people, you know, and I could work where a lot of people couldn't work with groups of eight to 10 or 12. I had no problem because I would, you know, I learned how to separate them by their skills and work that way. So uh, when I retired, I retired as an administrator from in the Boston Public Schools. Mm -hmm. I had become a director of bilingual education in Boston. I had worked with training, uh, you know, different. I wrote some proposals, Title VII proposals. So I had a, a group of skills that, you know, what else mm -hmm. can I say? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's somewhat, uh, you know, and poetry, I always loved poetry. So even when I retired, I used to come here and read poetry before I think you were here, mm -hmm. probably. Um, in fact, one of the rooms, not this room, but the next room, we would meet on Saturdays as a group, you know, so. I'm just curious, when did you uh, move to Natick? Moving to Natick, uh, let's see. I was at Fort Devens, I think, at the time, playing in the 18th Army Band. Um, and living in uh, Somerville, I found, right. mm -hmm. we found a place in Somerville. My mother was taking care of Dr. Jones's office, right. and he said, look, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if I mentioned that, but he mm -hmm. said, take care of my office, and you, have, you can live here mm -hmm. rent free, and it was a beautiful home, still there, and every time I pass <laughs> it, right beside the, I, I, could bet, I think a Baptist church, mm -hmm. and uh, right at the bottom of the hill where the right. gangs were up. Um, and uh, I guess I've always had a, uh, I was president of my class when I was in high school and all like that, so I always could interact with people um, and learn from them as they were learning mm -hmm. from me, you know, so. I don't know if that gives you enough <laughs> to play with. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Did you move to Natick in the early 60s, late 50s? Hmm. When did we move to Natick? Um, it's got to be 60s, I think. Okay. I'll check with my wife because You'll check she, with your wife. She, you know. <laughs> well, if, if that's, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Rafael de Grudela, we thank you so much okay, my for taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History okay. Project. Yep.